So you want to improve your Spanish, huh? Well, let me start out by congratulating you for being one of the few native English speakers who are willing and excited about stepping outside of your box, your comfort zone, and learning a new language and taking on that challenge. Not a lot of us do it simply because the rest of the world is spending their time learning our language. So kudos to you for that. In this video, we're going to talk about pronunciation, structure and grammar of the Spanish language, as well as vocabulary. So if you're ready to do this, then let's get this party started. One of the biggest mistakes that we make when trying to learn a new language is really focusing on what we are seeing rather than what we are hearing. Let's think about the way that a baby learns. They spend the first nine or 10 months of their lives just absorbing everything like a sponge, listening, 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 and finally one day they try to replicate those sounds. That's exactly how we should be trying to learn no matter how old we are. It's really about listening, tuning into those sounds and letting our mouth figure out how exactly to make them. This is especially important because English and Spanish share the same alphabet. So we tend to assume that as long as we can read something, then we'll know how to pronounce it. Big mistake. Spanish pronunciation, as you have probably noticed, is completely different from English pronunciation. And I'm gonna try to give you guys a little bit of a shortcut to understanding the basics. Let's start with the vowels. In English, we have something insane like 19 different vowel sounds, if you can even imagine that. It depends on what accent we're talking about. I believe that Australians have the most vowel sounds of all of the different accents, regionally speaking. But lucky for you, in Spanish, we have five vowel sounds, a, e, i, o, and u, and that is it. Now, if you can master these five sounds, you are well on your way to sounding like a native speaker. You've really got to get your tongue used to being in a different place in your mouth to create these sounds. So close your eyes and really, really try to repeat these sounds exactly as I'm saying them, okay? A, e. E, O, U. I close my eyes too. <laughs> From there we have combinations of two separate vowel sounds within one syllable, and these are called diptongos or diphthongs, which sounds like an insult, but I promise it's not. <laughs> now, it's ironic that the word diptongo doesn't have any diphthong in it. Such a wasted opportunity. But anyway, let's try pronouncing some common words with diptongos in them. Agua, aire. Hielo, tiempo, cuando, cuidado, novio. Great work. <laughs> now there are some key consonants that are pronounced completely differently as well that we're gonna go over. And again, mastering these will make a huge difference to make you sound more like a native speaker. The first consonant I wanna talk about is R. Now we all know that R is pronounced very differently in Spanish than in English. Think about where your tongue is though when you're saying R in English. R. It's kind of far back and your tongue does come up and get close to the roof of your mouth. Now what happens when we say R in Spanish? R. It comes up and the tip of our tongue is going to do a little bit of a vibration with the roof of our mouth right behind the teeth. R. You can get ready for the Spanish R by doing this. <laughs> if that's hard for you, work on it. Think about putting your tongue right behind those teeth, let it come up to the roof of your mouth, and then let some air through and vibrate your vocal cords. That sounds a little bit complicated, but just try to replicate this sound. <laughs> now, honestly, the R is not that exaggerated. Let's hear what it sounds like within a few different words. Carro. Rojo. Rico. Arroz. Now Spanish also has a shorter sounding R that will show up generally at the end of words or it will appear in the middle of a word as a single R rather than a double R. And it sounds a little bit like this. Amar, cariño, cortar. So while corro means run, coro means choir. Can you hear the difference? Corro, coro. While carro means car, caro, means expensive. 
Carro. Carro. I like to compare the short R in Spanish to the English D. It's very, very similar because your tongue comes up, touches the roof of your mouth, and goes back down rather quickly. So think of saying a word like cadet. Caro. It's almost the same sound. Our T is also very different in Spanish. If you've ever been in front of a really sensitive mic, you've definitely noticed how much air comes out when you say T in English. In Spanish, not so much. Let's listen to the difference. T. 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 So while for the English T, our tongue goes to the roof of our mouth, right behind the teeth, for the Spanish T, our tongue actually touches our teeth. T. Let's listen to a few more examples. Tigre. Tesoro. Atar. Triángulo. The Spanish D is a really interesting one because it's almost the exact same sound that we make in English for TH at the beginning of a word such as this, not TH at the beginning of a word such as think. I told you guys English was complicated. <laughs> so yes, think about saying the word the, for example. The. You see what your tongue and teeth are doing? The. That's almost exactly the same sound as the Spanish letter D. It's basically the same phenomenon as with the English T versus the Spanish T. Your tongue is going to be right behind your teeth in English, and it's going to go ahead and come up and touch your teeth in Spanish. So let's listen to the difference. D. De. D. De. Dormir. Dedo. Digo. Dulce. The last letter I want to highlight specifically is the letter L. Now, if you think about someone who's speaking with a little bit of a Chicano accent, you can imagine them saying something like, why are you looking at me like that? That L is being pronounced like the OG Spanish L. It sounds a little bit more precise. Your tongue kind of comes up in more of a point, whereas in English, your tongue's further back and air is coming out the sides. L. L. Listen to the difference between lemon and limón. Let's go over a few more L words. Luz, leer, alarma, colegio, clase, ligero. Something really interesting to note is that each individual language has its own resting place for the mouth, for the tongue, if you will. And generally when people are hesitating, the noise that they make sort of indicates where that resting point is. So if you hear a German hesitating, they're gonna say something like, which is super awkward for us to do as Americans. When a native Spanish speaker hesitates, they'll generally say something like, em, este, and that's indicative of their resting place. So if you can get your mouth into the right starting position or resting position for the language that you're trying to speak, it's gonna make it a whole lot easier. Now, you will be going against the muscle memory that you've developed over the years, by speaking the same language and making the same sounds over and over and over. So it will be an uphill battle, don't get me wrong, but it can be done. Let's move on to some common mistakes that we make as native English speakers. The first one that comes to mind is confusing the verb ser with the verb estar. Now both of these are translated into English as to be. So how do we know which one to use in which situation? Well, as a general rule, and you'll notice that I'll mention general rules a lot because all rules in language were meant to be broken, ser tends to be more permanent and estar tends to be more temporary. So if you're describing something that's unchangeable, you're going to use ser. For example, soy de Estados Unidos. You can't change your past, you can't change where you're from. Soy mujer. Soy bilingüe. Now I suppose I could change my bilingual status, However, this is still considered one of those intrinsic qualities. <laughs> Estar you're going to use for things like location and mood. So, estoy de buen humor. Estoy en mi casa. Estoy loca. After all, bouts of craziness are only temporary, right? <laughs> now, this can be really fun if you're trying to say something like, I'm bored. What would you use, ser or estar? I'll wait. If you said ser, you just called yourself boring. Soy aburrida literally means I am boring. Estoy aburrida, now that means I'm bored. 
I personally don't believe in getting bored, so I don't really need either of those. But anyway. Now there are a few exceptions or oddities, gray areas if you will. One of them is time. You might assume that time is something that passes and therefore you should use estar. However, that is not the case. Just know that whenever you're talking about time, you're going to use the verb ser. ¿Qué hora es? Es la una y media. ¿Qué horas son? Equally as correct as que hora es, by the way. Son las 2.45. Another really unexpected one. Mexico is in North America. Do you think you would use ser or estar to describe this? Surprisingly, you use estar. México está en North America. Not because Mexico is planning on uprooting anytime soon and heading off to the European Union, but because when you're talking about location, you simply use the word estar. Whether it's me being located at my house, yo estoy en mi casa, or the planet Earth being located within the solar system. El planeta Tierra está en el sistema solar. What do real estate agents say? Location, location, location. Estar, estar, estar. Always use estar when talking about location. Now there are many things that I love about Spanish and one of them is that it introduces us to a whole new set of things to worry about. Whether our nouns are masculine or feminine. And as a general rule, again, very general because there are many exceptions, Nouns that end in O are going to be masculine, and nouns that end in A are going to be feminine. Masculine nouns go along with masculine articles such as el and los, and feminine nouns go along with feminine articles such as la and las. Here are some examples. We have el perro, el auto, el niño, or in plural, los perros, los autos, los niños. For feminine, we have la casa, la tienda, la niña. Feminine plural, las casas, las tiendas, las niñas. Now here are a few of the exceptions and there are more, okay? This is not a comprehensive list. We have el día, el clima, el mapa, el idioma. Those were words that sound like they would be feminine, but they are actually masculine. Now here we have a list of words that sound like they'd be masculine, but are actually feminine. La mano. La foto. La moto. La radio. Now those last three there is a reason for. La foto would actually be la fotografía, and that is feminine. So even when you abbreviate fotografía and call it foto, which is what basically everyone in the world does at this point, you still keep that feminine article. La motocicleta is actually the long word for la moto, so again, same phenomenon. And actually, radio is the same way. La radiofonía was the original word that has now been shortened to radio. So they've kept their essence as feminine nouns, but now they sound like they would be masculine because the shortened version ends in O. Now, nouns that end in E are rebels. They really don't like to adhere to any rules, although I guess you could say percentage-wise most of them are male, but there really are too many exceptions to even call that a rule. Let's look at some examples. La noche. El baile. La torre. El puente. La fuente. Now, how weird is that that there can be two words that rhyme and one is masculine and one is feminine? It's like identical twins that are girl and boy. <laughs> La fuente, which means the fountain, and el puente, which means the bridge. And there's something that really annoys me that I have to throw in right now. There is a city in LA called La Puente, which is incorrect. There is a city that is grammatically incorrect. How did anyone let that happen? Anyway, sorry. So not only do we have to specify gender, we have to specify number as well, like we would with this and these. Things to keep in mind. Again, with a lot of repetition and listening to conversations, a lot of these things are going to be natural, but it is important just to keep them in mind. They can be a little confusing at first when you're starting to learn Spanish. Conjugations, conjugations. A can of worms that I don't even want to open right now, but I will say this. Conjugations in Spanish are so extremely specific that you often don't even have to call out the subject when you're using them. And what I mean by this is, just by hearing the verb that has already been conjugated, you know if we're referring to me, you, him, her, them, or us. A common mistake English speakers make is using the word yo unnecessarily. Where it doesn't sound wrong per se, it does sound a little bit 
unnecessary. <laughs> If you want to express how happy you are, although yo estoy contenta is said correctly, a simple estoy contenta will suffice. If you want to say you're hungry, no need to say yo tengo hambre. You can just say tengo hambre. If you're cold, tengo frío. You may be noticing a trend here. In Spanish, we use the verb tener, I have, in many cases where in English we would be using I am. Tengo 35 años. I am 35 years old. If you're thirsty, tengo sed. If you're in a hurry, tengo prisa. If you're tired, tengo sueño. If you're a woman, I mean, if you're right, tengo razón. If you want to tell someone to be careful, ten cuidado. All of those use the verb tener, to have. Now here's a fun tip. Whenever you hear a native Spanish speaker making a mistake in English, they're actually giving you a little insight into the way Spanish is structured. So for example, you might hear a native Spanish speaker say, the American people is very friendly. Now there are a few things wrong with this sentence, but it all makes sense when you know Spanish. First of all, the American people. I guess that would make sense if you're addressing the nation in a very formal way, but generally you would just say American people. And now in Spanish, gente, people, is actually a singular noun. So where we would say people are, they would say la gente es. La gente americana es muy amigable or los americanos son muy amigables. But notice that article, los. You gotta have it. <laughs> a native Spanish speaker may say, we're going out the next weekend. We wouldn't say this because in English there's no need for the word the, but in Spanish there is. Vamos a salir el próximo fin de semana. You absolutely do need that el in there. For adjectives, remember that in Spanish we put them after the noun, which makes all the sense in the world if you think about it. I mean, why would you start describing something before saying what said thing is, am I right? <laughs> so logical, just like the metric system. Therefore, a big house is una casa grande. A gloomy day, un día gris. A smart person, una persona inteligente. Now there are exceptions such as feliz cumpleaños and buen día, but in general when you're describing something, say what it is first. Llevo una camisa blanca. I'm wearing a white shirt. Now guys, that's about all we're going to cover in this video and let me tell you, we have barely scratched the surface. But before you get all discouraged and think, you know what, I don't think my brain's capable of handling all of this craziness and adopting an entire new language, give your brain a little bit more credit. You have actually already mastered an entire language with all of its nuances and rules and exceptions and a lot of what you're doing, you're not even aware of. So yes, you absolutely are capable of learning a second language, a third language, a fourth language. All that you really need to do is give it that effort, give it that time and really go for it. So congratulations for having the will, the curiosity and the drive to keep on learning Believe me, with those three things, you're already way ahead of the curve. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun hanging out with you guys and sharing some of my insights. I gotta credit my sister, Heather. We had a great conversation before I recorded this. She's a Spanish teacher and she is legitimately one of the smartest people ever and has so many great insights. So anyway, if you enjoyed this or learned anything from it, please let me know down below. I will be responding comments. I would love to hear from you and of course, Subscribe to my channel if you want awesome content both in Spanish and in English. Hey, I can help you practice if you need to. I'm Holly. It has been real, y'all. I'll talk to you soon. Adios.